Good afternoon or good evening, everybody. Welcome, thank you for joining us today. My name is Sandra Galea, and I have the great privilege of serving as Dean of the Boston University School of Public Health. I'm here today in my capacity as chair of the Rockefeller Boston University 3D Commission. The 3D Commission, with the 3D stand for determinants, data, and decision-making, was started as a partnership between Rockefeller Foundation and Boston University in the beginning of 2019. The vision behind the commission was to say, where is our thinking on the social determinants of health? Where is it advanced to? And how can we get better at measuring social determinants to the end of making decisions that improve health that take the social determinants into account? The idea really emerged from recognizing that our global conversation on the social economic determinants has advanced quite a bit in the past five to 10 years, building really on a quarter century of scholarship and conversation about them. And it was really time to think about the next phase. And the next phase was, how do we make sure that when policy decisions are made, social and economic determinants are borne in mind? To do this, we assembled a global commission with 24 commissioners from around the world. And the commission deliberated for um, a two-year period, emerging with a report that was released at the UN General Assembly meeting about three weeks ago. Now, I mentioned that the commission started at the beginning of 2019 because the timing here is relevant. Because of course, at the beginning of 2019, we, none of us had ever heard of COVID before. By the time the commission launched was the end of 2019, beginning of 2020, uh, the commission's work unfolded against the backdrop of COVID. And if there was anything that ever made it clear how much social determinants mattered, it was COVID. Because for anybody who was paying attention, it was very clear that COVID was fundamentally, yes, an infectious disease, but it was a disease that reflected underlying social and economic drivers more than anything else. And really COVID revealed what we knew already, that there is no health without paying attention to the underlying social economic structures. There is no health without taking into account characteristics of place, of the places where we live, where we work, where we play. And that decisions that we make about those places, about the economies, about our social context, fundamentally shape the health of populations, the health, health of everybody, but in particular, the health of marginalized groups. The Commission's report articulated six principles and four recommendations that fundamentally aim to push forward this conversation. I would encourage anybody here to take a look at the Commission's website and to download the report. And the intention behind the report was to start a conversation, was to say, can we move forward to the next stage in thinking about social determinants? Can we get better at understanding those determinants so that decisions made about transportation, about housing, about the economy, all keep health in mind so that together we can make decisions that improve health for populations worldwide. As part of getting these ideas out there, as part of encouraging this conversation, we have been hosting a series of these 3D conversations where we have been inviting distinguished scholars, distinguished uh, practitioners, distinguished leaders to talk about the ideas behind the commission's report, to really just talk about what we articulated in the report, but broadly speaking, to talk about their intersection with the ideas in the report. And th these conversations are not meant to be dispositive. We're not, are, we're not offering specific solutions, but they are intended to keep the conversation going and to encourage anybody who then listens to these conversations to keep the conversation going in their own forum. So today we're, I'm really delighted to have with us uh, someone very special, um, Dr. Julio Frank. So let me uh, read the formal introduction for Dr. Frank. So Dr. Frank currently is president of the University of Miami. Prior to joining the University of Miami, Dr. Frank served as the Dean and the, at the Harvard T. H. Chan School of Public Health and the Angelopoulos Professor of Public Health and International Development, a joint appointment with the Harvard Kennedy School of Government. Dr. Frank has, a, has an illustrious career in public health. He was Minister of Health of Mexico from 2000 to 2006, where he pursued an ambitious agenda to reform the nation's health system and introduced a program of comprehensive universal coverage, which expanded access to healthcare for 55 million previously uninsured persons. Dr. Frank's career has included leadership positions in all relevant aspects of public health and higher education, research, teaching, analysis, public policies, institution building, international cooperation, and national public service. He has been involved in various initiatives to reform higher education. And on a personal note, Dr. Frank has long time been a friend, a friend and a mentor. I've learned a lot from Dr. Frank, both reading um, his writing as well as in conversations with him. So Dr. Frank, Julio, it's a pleasure to have you. It's an honor to have you with us. Thank you, Sandro. It's my pleasure. So let me let me start with a bit of a general question, if I may, and um, and uh, really um, get your overall reactions. You know, my initial premise that I started this conversation with is that our thinking about social determinants has evolved quite a bit in the past. I said five, ten years, building on twenty-five years of scholarship. Can you reflect on 
the arc of our thinking about social determinants as it's intersected with your career, because your career has really spanned this time frame. Where were we? Where are we? And where do you think we're headed with a social determinants scholarship and action agenda? You know, the, the, the triangle of the 3D is, is probably deciphering that has been at the core of many of the most fundamental uh, advances and debates in our field. Uh, and as you say, I mean, there's a long tradition, intellectual tradition, linking the health of individuals to the conditions in which they live. But it's not only recently that we've become, we've, we've developed systematic um, and a systematic approach. I mean, the research actually starts in the 19th century, documenting the, the health impacts of the living conditions of, uh, of working class members, especially during the rapid industrialization of Europe, and then extends throughout most of the 20th century. But I think a, a watershed moment is, of course, the commission of the social determinants that Sir Michael Marmot chaired and co-chaired actually with President, um, with President Lagos of Chile. It was a very interesting case <clears throat> and an example of leadership, by the way, in the Americas in thinking, but that, that a sitting head of, 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 of government and state as President Ricardo Lagos co-chaired that with a very distinguished scholar as Sir, Sir Michael Marmot. Uh, I think your, your commission is a very, very important step forward because it puts in a very, highlights that connection with decision-making. We have been talking about um, evidence-based uh, policy and evidence-based clinical practice, but, but, but that idea of having rigorous data driving also the conversation around social determinants, I think has been lagging and I think your commission really, really filled that gap. Now, as I look at, at that triangle, you know, the, the first piece is, of course, the relationship between the, the, uh, the social determinants and what we do mostly in the health system. That's, that's been a matter of great debate. And of course, we now know, and there's very, very ample evidence throughout this whole intellectual trajectory that I just described, of the determining effect of some social conditions like education, like, like work, like environmental circumstances, housing, et cetera, on health. Now, we also understand that the relationship operates the other way around. And I think the pandemic was a great example and reminder of the power of that mutually reinforcing codependence. Because you know, we've known for a long time that economic conditions are a determinant of health. Mm -hmm. But what we've seen now in action is how a health event, like an outbreak of an infectious disease that then becomes a global pandemic, how that has been a major determinant of economic performance, economic growth, triggering the largest economic recession in a century. So that, that's one progress, I think, where we've understood better the bilateral um, the directionality, the bidirectionality of that crucial relationship. The second piece that I would say has been progress is I think in the early discussions on social determinants, it was a little bit of a dichotomous thinking. Mm -hmm. People would either emphasize interventions on the social determinants to improve health or acting at the level of the formal healthcare system to improve health. And that was especially in the 1970s and 80s a vigorous debate in its worst expression, I, I think led to what, what has been called the, the doctrine of therapeutic nihilism. Mm -hmm. The idea that no matter how much you do to provide healthcare, it really doesn't matter because it's all a, a matter of determinants. I think we've gone past that and we understand that actually the way the health system gets structured and funded is itself a social determinant. And, 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 and I think that's, I think we've moved past that dichotomous thinking that was very much at the beginning. And, and we understand that the structure functioning and, and the political weight of the formal healthcare system is in and of itself a social determinant because it's a social construct and subject to the dynamics, the political dynamics of a society. And then the, the third piece, which I think you really make an important contribution is bringing the data in, 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 into that and, and really spelling out how interventions at the level of the social determinants can be as rigorous, sometimes even based on random designs, mm 
as clinical interventions. And the idea of intervening at the level of the determinants and generating valid information that then is, is translated so that there can, it can be used for policy making. I think that's, that's the, the third piece here. And so on, on all those three vectors, I think we, we have made quite a bit of progress. Uh, it's, that's actually really interesting. So let me let me go to um, sort of some things that you've you've mentioned in the past because um, you've long sort of talked about um, um, the role of stakeholders in being involved in decision making and 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 you've you've written before about um, that stakeholders involved have to reach a consensus about the what before they can arrive at the how. So I was wondering if you can tie it into your practical experience when you were minister of health in Mexico and you led health system reform. Can, can you talk a little bit about how the what and the how there? Um, actually realize themselves? And, and, and how did that intersect with social economic realities for you? Well, you know, the, I, I was very privileged to serve as, as uh, the federal secretary of health in Mexico from 2000 to 2006. I was at the World Health Organization when Dr. Grove Rutland was the, the director general, and I had created a new area called evidence and information for policy, speaking about, about using data for policy. That was a whole new area that led to um, the most famous product of that was the World Health Report 2000, which for the first time actually did a, a ranking of countries according to the performance of their health system. It was very data intensive. And at that point, that was a historic election, the first fully democratic election in Mexico, and the president who got elected, uh, uh, you know, was looking for new faces. I was, I didn't even vote, although I wanted him to win, uh, because I was in Geneva. But he actually looked for experts. What a, it, it, today it might seem like a crazy idea when we see cabinets bringing in billionaires and things like that. There was that idea that if you wanted new faces in politics, you could actually bring for certain ministries like health experts. So that's how I ended up in that position. And so it was expected, and that was my signature, that it was going to be very much an evidence-based reform. Mm -hmm. And what I discovered is, I had the intuition, but I actually saw it in action, is the power of good evidence to bring about political consensus. Because again, that's often a false, a false dichotomy between political realities and technical, the political and the technical, we tend to they actually, if they're done well, can reinforce each other. And to give you one example, <clears throat> no, we did the first ever a, a national health accounts exercise, a very rigorous account, uh, exercise that demonstrated that contrary to what most people believed, including many experts, the main source of funding for healthcare in Mexico had stopped being public allocations uh, by government. People thought it was because there were a lot of public institutions and a lot of doctors worked in, and nurses worked in the public sector. It was mostly funded. We demonstrated that already in the year 2000, more than half of health expenditures were private out of pocket expenditures. People paying out of pocket because there was a failure in access and a lack of coverage from insurance. And we, for the first time, measured the fact that 4, 4 million families families every year became impoverished because their family experienced catastrophic health expenditures. Here's an example of how a poorly functioning health system then becomes a determinant of poverty, which then feeds back into worsening health. It's a double whammy on those families. They're already poor, hence they're uninsured, but by virtue of being uninsured, health, which should be a, the instrument to empower people to rise out of poverty because of a poorly structured health system, deepens the condition of poverty because it was most of that catastrophic expenditure happening in the poorest families. That was an invisible situation. No one had seen it because although eventually we all experience serious health problems, we are all going to die, except on pandemics, at any given point in time, it's only a relatively small proportion of people who experience catastrophic expenditures. At any given point in time, although over a, over a lifetime, most families will experience them if they are uninsured. 
So we were able to make visible the invisible, and that's the actually the etymology of evidence. You are Italian, so you know this very well. It comes from videre, from to see, making the invisible visible, bringing that to the fore, and agreeing on the what, and the what there was. It is unacceptable. It is ethically and politically and socially unacceptable to have families who become impoverished because they get sick and they don't have the financial protection mechanisms and the access to health care. And, and, and it was actually very powerful evidence to bring consensus around uh, uh, from every political party. There were three main parties then, uh, center, center, a left of center, a right of center. All of them agreed that that result was unacceptable. And that then drove a major piece of legislation, all parties voted to greatly expand public expenditure in health so as to protect families from the financial consequences of disease. And I, 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 I say it's a, it's a textbook example of evidence-based policy, but evidence that then drives political agreement. Once we agree on the what, the what is we need to, we, we need to treat healthcare as a right, and therefore it's unacceptable that people will become in poverty because of, of, of lack of, of financial protection for health. Therefore, that one was agreed upon, and then it was, it, that was hey, the doctor. Whole, but, but we had to then uh, bring forward into the house, which was a bit uh, uh, less complicated. Uh, Alicia, jump in. That's fine. I, th I think was, there, was a, there was there was a phone ringing, which is which is I think they were trying to stop, which is fine. Um, um, so let me let me pick up on something you said, Julio, um, if I may, because I think you, you said something. In, there was something implicit in what you said, which is when the, when you showed the data, this became clear it was unacceptable. And and I, I think it's a really interesting point that you made. That is um, that it became unacceptable then to multiple parties. Now, when you say something becomes unacceptable, that's a moral judgment, right? Like, like there, there, there is value being attributed to it. And I've written about before about our role in making an empiric argument and a moral argument. And I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about the two, because your statements imply that actually the two are almost inextricable. And I actually find that very interesting. Yeah, you know, I, I do think uh, following uh, writings of a colleague that uh, you know, Michael Reich from the Harvard School of Public Health, spoke up, he speaks about three pillars of public policy. The technical. Hi, Dr. Policy. Frank, I'm so sorry to interrupt. It sounds like there's a, a phone ring. Is there a phone ringing over there? Let, let me check because that could be. Yes. <clears throat> You're right, I, I, it, it was a phone ringing here. I don't know why, but <laughs> there, so uh, my apologies for that. Uh, there, there, you know, the idea of three pillars, the technical, the ethical, and the political. And, um, and, and, and if, if, you, if you assemble them right, those three pillars really sustain the edifice of, of enlightened public policy. The technical is most about the use of good data. Mm -hmm. um, you can use that data to drive that kind of ethical conversation. For example, what is unacceptable for a society? As, as we did with the data on the large number of, of families, mostly poor families, who were sunk into deeper poverty because they had to pay for healthcare. And that's fundamentally an ethical deliberation that then drives political consensus that then makes action possible. And it is a very interesting um, example of how the three reinforce each other. <clears throat> and, and, you, you know, I think it, when we talk about uh, social determinants, actually, I have found that it is, the, it, that talking about the ultimate impact on health, because health is, has a huge political value. It's almost a naturally unifying, topic in, in politics, you find easier, you find it easier because it's such a fundamental aspect of the human experience. You find it easier to reach agreement. Um, I'm worried about 
how the pandemic has actually started to erode that, as we have seen with the politicization of some of the public health measures like face coverings and, and, and vaccines. But that's a separate topic. We may come back to that. Traditionally, it's been easier to reach agreement. And you can then backtrack and make the argument that, for example, uh, there are some in interventions at the level of, of those determinants that are valued in, in themselves, but that have an additional value because of their impact on health. Example, expanding educational opportunity. It's valued in itself, but if you can then make the argument that then it also has the positive effect on health. And the other way around, I was able to argue convincingly with the finance minister that improving health was intrinsically valued, but that if, and in addition, if we did that, that would make the economy grow, which is the main, the main job of the finance minister because of that other directionality of, of, of causality, how improved health actually benefits the economy, competitiveness, et cetera, how having people not go into poverty because they have, are uninsured actually improves the savings rates and therefore leads to economic, uh, valued economic outcomes as well. And, and so it, it is an interesting case how good data can actually drive that political uh, consensus. And, and, and that's been my, my experience that those three pillars actually can be made to function in harmony. So, so the, the um, every time you you say something, I'm now thinking of five more questions. But let me try to <laughs> myself. Um, um, so let's talk. Let, let me be um, let me be contrarian for a second about about uh, the current moment. And let's talk about the politicization, which you hinted at, and you said we may get to it. I should get to it right now. So, in the, when we were grappling with the report, one of the things that we grappled with was about the politicization of data. And uh, you talked a little bit in your in your comment about the politicization of health. I was wondering if you can talk about the phenomenon of in 2021, 2020, 2021, the acute polarization of a lot of the conversations that we've had around health and around, I would argue, also around data. And, and I would argue it's much more so than it's been any time in the past uh, two decades. So where are we at on that? And where does it leave us? And, and, and give me hope, give, give me a rays of hope, um, because I, I, I always would like to lean into optimism. You know, I think the pandemic has had very bright spots and very dark spots. The bright spots have been, has been mostly the amazing cooperation among scientists from, from all over the world, across sectors, obviously academic institutions, private companies, governments, everyone collaborating that among other things have, have provided vaccines in record time. Uh, uh, but the dark side has been the politicization of the pandemic, including the data about the pandemic. And, you know, unfortunately the pandemic coincides with the rise of populism around the world and the erosion of democratic principles. This was going on before the pandemic. Mm -hmm. And, you know, our conversation today is focused on the Americas. The Americas has been an epicenter of that. And <clears throat> I'm not saying there's a cause and effect relationship here but it is striking that the worst performances in the world actually happened, especially at the beginning of the pandemic, among those countries that had populist leaders. And if you look in the Americas, it was the United States back then at the beginning of the pandemic, Mexico, unfortunately, my own country, and Brazil. And you know, some self-define themselves as uh, they find themselves as left-wing or right-wing populism. I think that's actually secondary. It's the populism that's that's actually. The, the piece that's politicized the, the data. Because now this didn't start with the pandemic. We were already witnessing statements about post-truth politics. Mm -hmm. and, and of course, the rise of social media has only made that, that uh, more, more serious. Uh, but, but one thing we saw among the darkest spots was the display of public leaders, uh, political leaders, sorry, heads of government, contradicting the opinion of experts. And if you go back at the beginnings, early, you know, February, March, uh, even after Domicho had declared the, the pandemic, presidents, and I, I mentioned those three in this continent, there were others in other parts, India, um, Turkey, uh, other <clears throat> parts of the world. But, but here in the Americas, very notably, the three largest 
uh, federal countries, all of them, with the presidents actually contradicting, minimizing the pandemic, uh, saying it really wasn't such, such a bad thing, um, uh, refusing to wear face coverings in public, all three presidents did the same thing. Mm -hmm. um, I will leave it to psychoanalysts in the future to analyze <laughs> what is the psychological insecurity that leads a political leader to refuse to wear a face cover as a sign of weakness, when it is a sign of consideration for the others, which used to be a virtue for politicians, showing that you care for others, used to be something good for a politician. How did we end, end in that? And those, those behaviors were very similar. A discourse that, that uh, it, the, the populist discourse tends to polarize by pitching the good people, the people who the leader self proclaims that he, and it's always he's, <laughs> it's always men, that he uh, represents, and the corrupt elites. And among them are the experts, are the scientists. This, there, there's been a, an attack on science, even though everyone then rushed to science to try to develop vaccines and save the day for, for, for their countries. But the discourse is fundamentally against, uh, against evidence. And so in, in one of those contradictions of the pandemic, you had the general public exposed like never before I've seen to public health experts on, on every, on TV, on social media. I mean, you were there, I was interviewed, you know, a, a lot of colleagues, uh, Dr. Fauci became a celebrity. We were out there in, in force at, at a level I had never seen because people were, were, were really <laughs> wanting to have information. And yet at the same time, this erosion by having them political leaders contradict a lot of that. And then all of that degenerated into this uh, um, infodemic of, of mis and uh, disinformation and, and misinformation that's done so much um, damage during the pandemic, including now with, the, with fueling uh, vaccine hesitancy, or fact, vaccine refusal, actually, it's not even hesitancy. You know, I, I, uh, I keep uh, thinking that the book that I really would love to read is uh, one day a historian is going to write a book of just one month, the, the history of February 15th to March 15th of 2020, because I, I can't help but feel that the decisions that were made in that one month and the intersection of forces, political forces and communication forces that really then determined the course of the world over the course of the next two years. And uh, that one month was when we took a pandemic and politicized it to the nth degree because of the confluence of factors that we were in. So wh where is this going to take us? Like wh where, um, let's assume we will emerge from the pandemic sooner or later, hopefully sooner. What, what do you see as a viable path forward to detangle, the, so, so to, to maintain the positive, which is the visibility of health, the, the role of health, which I agree with you, you and I are on the same page, the role of health as a potential unifier across sectors, but shedding the the partisan lint that has accumulated with the with, with, with the narrative of health. Well, you know, I think um, we need to be uh, intentional about that. I, I, I said, you know, the, the pandemic has produced a lot of loss. There's been a huge amount of loss, life, livelihoods. You know, the if you look now at the latest data on excess mortality at, at a global level. Um, I, I chair the board of the Institute for Health Metrics and Evaluation, and, and the latest estimates are, are you know, point to, to excess of deaths um, in the order of 14 million deaths. The official count is close to 5 million, but it's, it's likely now part of that is not deaths caused directly by the virus, but, but deaths from other causes of, uh, of death. Uh, due to diseases that, 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 that uh, the care for which was delayed because of the mishandling of the pandemic. I mean, you have a drop in immunization for other things, forget the, the COVID vaccine. Um, in, in many parts of the developing world, you have delays in the treatment of chronic illnesses like cancer and others. So when you add both directly caused by, the, by, by, by COVID, that's caused by COVID and indirectly caused by the pandemic, because of the deferment or people just being scared of going to a healthcare facility and dying at home from other diseases. It's an incredible toll uh, of, of, and, and we're still not at, at the other end so far. 
it's it's an agreeable call. Even even you know the causes that have been certified to be COVID, five million deaths. So a lot of death, a lot of suffering from the the families, the the patients, and then you know the impact. As you said, the pandemic magnified the pre-existing social inequalities because obviously cases, hospitalizations, and deaths have been much much worse in country after country in uh, disadvantaged groups. Um, the so-called essential workers, who were, which were more, much more exposed to, to the risk of contagion and who had the least access to personal protective equipment, tend to be you know, people from lower socioeconomic status or from uh, racial and ethnic minorities, underprivileged groups. The impact this has had on women, the, the, the gender dimension of, uh, of the pandemic response. Women have lost jobs at a much higher rate of, than men. They have had to deal with the consequences of having children at home without access to school. The effect this is gonna have on the loss of schooling for children. I mean, we are at risk of a whole generation of children who lag behind dramatically and, and, and we, we, we gotta deal, do something of a, of a dramatic catch up. And then you have this erosion of public trust by politicizing the pandemic and the spread of misinformation, the misuse of social media, which of course, you know, was born with a great expectation that it would be a liberating force. How do we get out of that? It's, it's, uh, it's easy to fall into this pair, but that's not what we should do. We actually need to be invigorated by one notion and coming again to ethical reasoning. Those of us who are still here who didn't die and, and those of us who didn't lose our jobs and, and, and uh, experiencing the suffering but are still here have a, a, an ethical obligation to make sure that when we're out of the pandemic, what we emerge to is not a new normal, but it's a better normal. It would be, of course, unacceptable to just go back to the old normal. I think we've seen for example, in terms of pre-existing social inequalities, how badly that has, has done. We shouldn't go back to that. But people talk about a new normal. I think it, we have a moral duty to, to really make it a, a, a collective purpose to build a better normal. And that means spelling out the, these different dimensions and deliberately try to do that. Uh, and uh, I think there's widespread consensus on that what, the how, it's going to be more complicated than the example I gave, because it is a, 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 an effort that has to, to develop in multiple fronts, many of them on those social determinants of health, many on rebuilding health systems. The health systems, the public health part of the health system showed all its limitations. We have serious limitations on the global health system. I think we need to find to derive from this enormous amount of laws, this tragic loss of a, the, the political will to build a better normal. And I see a lot of energy around that. There's no shortage of, uh, of proposals. Um, and, and so that to me is the, the hopeful pathway, pathway forward. Yeah, I, I'm actually delighted you, you mentioned that. I, I really like the notion of the moral obligation to, to move to a better normal. And I, I um, the, the notion that, uh, and, and part of things which I've been using in my writing and my speaking, is that uh, COVID fundamentally illustrated what was there before to a place where we could no longer avoid it, where it became unacceptable to continue to avoid seeing things that we should have seen before. Let me switch tack for a second. I, I want to ask you about um, international differences. I want to talk a little bit about low-income countries, middle-income countries, and high-income countries. I was wondering if I could um, get your perspective on the place of social and economic determinants thinking in low-income countries, middle-income countries, and high-income countries. There's a lot of uh, there's a lot of discussion now about global health equity. Some of it, I think, quite superficial, unfortunately. But I was wondering if we, how you think we can leverage a social determinants agenda to advance health where it's needed most, namely low-income countries, and maybe whether COVID has offered us a fulcrum to do that. Yeah, I mean, you know, we have a, um, a very complex picture. When I started in global health, the world was a relatively simple world, right? You basically had communicable diseases, mostly the problem of poor countries, and then you have the non-communicable agenda, 
mostly the problem of industrialized because that was the, the construction. I don't think it was true even then, but that was the, the simplification we had. So deriving priorities was a, a, you know, fairly straightforward. You need to focus on infectious diseases, especially vaccine preventable diseases in poor countries. And then you know, the issues of heart disease and diabetes and mental health and cancer was a problem with rich countries. And, and, and we placed the low and middle income countries in that package. And that for some time you know, led to giving rightful priority to things like vaccination and, and dealing with common or infectious diseases. But, but I think the evidence that started emerging uh, was that actually what was going on in lower and middle income countries was a much more complex epidemiologic transition than the one that currently rich countries had gone through. And, and in, 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 in currently wealthy countries, you had an epidemiologic transition that was largely characterized by a substitution of the leading causes of death from mostly infectious acute, and I think it's the acuteness that matters, and then for, for chronic non-communicable diseases. But you know, uh, I was involved early on in, in research that showed how non-communicable diseases were already rising at a much faster rate in developing countries, low and middle income countries. But the pattern was such that instead of a substitution, what you, has, what you has, had was a, a, a juxtaposition of pathologies. And that's where the whole idea of the double burden of disease came up, which now we supplement with the idea of a tri triple burden of disease, by which I mean that in low and middle income countries, you have a triple burden of disease represented first by the unfinished agenda of common infectious diseases and maternal mortality reproductive health events of which maternal mortality is the most important. Without having solved that, you already have the burden of non-communicable diseases that we used to think were most preponderant in rich countries, no longer true. The highest burdens today of heart disease, diabetes, obesity, mental health, cancer, is in developing countries. And then if that was not enough, you have the um, health consequences of, of, of of processes directly linked to globalization, because everything else is linked to globalization, but directly linked to globalization. The most dramatic example of which is, of course, pandemics. They affect all countries, irrespective of level of development. But the other big emerging looming threat is the health consequences of climate change. So managing that situation in, in, in low and middle income countries, which traditionally have not invested in health, and have not made that a priority is a very, very, very important challenge. And that's where the data part of the, th of the 3D is so important. You need solid evidence to drive, first of all, priority setting, learning what works. And then the, to me, the importance of investing in evidence-based interventions, upstream interventions, is that with that complexity in the downstream, where you have this double burden of communicable and non-communicable, it turns out that the social determinants actually act on all of those. Mm -hmm. The reason why you have a country like India with the largest absolute numbers of undernourished and obese children, same country, but it's not that within India, obesity is a problem of rich, it's also a problem of, of poverty, of, 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 of bad nutrition. And so if you can identify some, some of those upstream determinants that will impact multiple health outcomes, I think you have a powerful instrument there. And, and that's where the, the thinking about, um, about early interventions, again, not at the exclusion of having a well-functioning healthcare system that responds to the needs of people and, and prevents people from incurring in, in catastrophic health expenditures, as I was saying at the beginning. But, but, but that's where that makes sense. So, you know, building a, um, a, 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 you know, what the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation has called a culture of health that acts on determinants that have multiple impacts on multiple specific pathologies 
makes sense in every country, but particularly in countries that are facing this very complex um, double or now even triple burden of disease if you add those uh, threats from pandemics and, and climate change. That's really interesting. It's a, the, the triple burden uh, uh, formulation is actually quite interesting. And the, the, I've been thinking a lot lately about the slow burning threats that we do not see right now that, uh, that, are, that are coming, but they're, they're so ubiquitous that we're not seeing them. And I like how you're linking them to fundamentally features of a more globalizing world. Let me shift, let me shift um, uh, course for a second and ask about uh, education and the workforce, because one of the things, one of the hallmarks of your career has been uh, really, you've, I, I think you've always had a, a focus on educating the next generation, on, uh, on creating the best possible workforce. Can you talk a little bit about your thoughts about how an agenda, social determinants, data-driven social determinants agenda intersects with what we should be thinking about the next generation, training the workforce for the future, and, and, and how should we be thinking about that, both from the point of view of educators, but also from the point of view of learners, and how should learners be thinking about it? I think it's a very important question. Um, you know, in, in, in 2010, to mark the 100th anniversary of the Fittingos Flexner Report of 1910 that really shaped, originally was focused on medical education, but it had a broad a, a medical education in the United States and Canada, that was the name of the report. It really had global impact and it shaped not just medical education, for, but all the other professions. Of course, in public health, we had five years later in 1915, the Walsh Ross Report, which did the same thing as the Flexner Report. Uh, but for the, that 100th anniversary of, of, of the Flexner Report, we, we created um, the, the um, uh, uh, Lancet Commission, sponsored by the, by the Lancet, it was called a Commission on, the, uh, 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 on, on Health uh, Professionals for the 21st Century. And the report was published in 2010 on the, 10th, on the 100th sorry, anniversary of, of the Flexner report. Uh, and already provide a glimpse about the, some of the emerging trends and the challenges that these new realities had on the education of health professionals. And there were already a number of movements. And I mean, you've been chair of the board of the uh, Association of Schools and Programs in Public Health. And as you know, you know there's been a, a, a big debate about the future. I, I was uh, privileged uh, to, to participate in some when, when I was dean of the School of Public Health at Harvard, and we did actually some of those reforms internally. And I know you're doing a lot of that innovation at the Boston University School of Public Health, and it's happening in many other parts. So we had actually planned 10 years after that report, so in, 20, uh, in, in 2020, an update, a follow-up. Um, and of, of course, the pandemic also interfered, so we're now actually finishing that follow-up and we hope it will be published early next year. Um, but what I, what I can tell you is that um, the idea of social determinants is very prominent even in the initial report. Because if I could summarize uh, you know, one of the big, big trends, uh, I mean, there's some big trends that are very positive. One is interprofessional education. The idea that we need to break out of this professional silos and build into the educational experience, the reality of the workplace, which is work in teams. But you have a disconnect now because once you're out there, you are working as teams, but in your education, we're all trained in this disciplinary or, or professional silos with separate schools of nursing and, and medicine. In the report, in the Lancet report, we actually even coined the term trans, uh, trans uh, professional to also include that part of the workforce that are not professionals, most importantly, community health workers, which are such an important part of action at the community level on social determinants. And so that movement towards interprofessional, a little bit less, I think we need to insist on the transprofessional component ought to be built. It ought, you shouldn't wait until you get to the reality of work to find the challenges of teamwork. That ought to be a core component of any curriculum because learning how to work as a team requires specific competencies. It's not something you pick up spontaneously. It should be part of the educational process. For example, it requires an appreciation for different perspectives, a, the development of the capacity to disagree respectfully and through a process of persuasive communication, 
come to an agreement and be able to mediate disagreements that you may have in any team. In the case of, of working effectively with community health workers, it requires sometimes cultural literacy, understanding different ways of framing health and disease or different ways of understanding uh, uh, social determinants. So that, that, that's been one big piece. And I see a lot of progress on that front, not as much as we need, but certainly uh, our follow-up will document that interprofessional education has really taken off. The other has been the, the rise of technologies. And here, this is one of the bright aspects of the pandemic. It accelerated, it didn't create the use of technology to expand access to educational material, but it greatly accelerated that trend. Uh, and I think uh, we, we need to, to, to build on, on that momentum because every university went at least in, at the first few months of the pandemic onto uh, remote learning and had to ad adopt and adapt. And I think mostly what we saw was a cultural change in, in um, acceptance by faculty who tend to be very resistant of some of those technologies. We need to build on that. But I, um, and then of course, we, we've seen the explosion. I mean, you know, 2012 was the famous year of the MOOCs, the rise of MOOCs and other uh, platforms to really improve access. But to me, the key switch is that increasingly we need to move along three levels of learning. I, I, in, in that I think is one of the most interesting formulations in, in the Lancet report. The first level we call informational learning, this, uh, informative learning, the second formative learning, and the third transformative learning. Informative learning is what it says. It's about having a corpus of existing accepted information knowledge uh, that's dynamic, that's constantly being renewed, but making sure that everyone masters that corpus of, of, uh, of, of facts and skills that form a profession. But that only makes you an expert. It's a very important part of education. It's unfortunately what we spend most of the time <laughs> educating, but it, and it is important, but it's only the first step. You need to build on that towards formative learning. And that, that is the process through which experts get socialized into becoming professionals. A profession is an expert, what you get with informative learning, an expert that has been socialized into an ethic of service, the idea of service. And then you need to go further to the third level. Transformative learning makes out of health professionals, not just experts and professionals, but agents of change. And that means deliberately building into the curriculum the development of leadership capabilities. And the key thing there is learning, if you're gonna be an agent of change, is the idea that those health professionals, doctors, nurses, public health professionals, and all the other health professions need to increasingly master not just the content, but the context of their practice, of their professional practice. Because what we've done traditionally is develop experts that informative learning that master the technical scientific content. And that's very important. We want competent people there. But increasingly, you need to understand the context. If I am providing care in a particular facility, who is never coming here? How do I understand that my goal is not just to provide healthcare, I need to do that at the highest level, but actually to increase levels of population health? How do I understand the organizational context in which I live and how the health system in which I operate is, for example, uh, making a lot of poor people poorer by not protecting them financially? And I don't think you can anymore be an effective member of the health workforce if in addition to mastering the content, you don't understand the context and decide to also be an agent for transforming for the good the context. And a lot of that context, in fact, I would argue all of that context is what we otherwise call social determinants of health. I've also found that uh, informative, formative, transformative are quite helpful, actually. Let's talk about context for a second, talk about the public. We've talked about scholars and we've talked about decision makers and we've talked about students. Let's talk about the public because um, there really is no progress in changing the conversation about things that matter to health without actually 
having the public be involved in that conversation. And in the commission, we talked quite a bit about the democracy of data and about the need for accountability of decision makers to data collected from communities and bringing the, the broader population along in understanding the need for data and accountability to decisions built on that data. I was wondering if you can comment a little bit, maybe leaning perhaps on your experience as Minister of Health, but also broadly in the many other sectors about our role and how we can engage in transformative efforts to change the public conversation on health so, so that we can make this conversation that you and I are having lingua franca, so that it emerges from sort of the ivory tower, so to speak, and becomes how health is understood. That's critical. And <clears throat> well, let, let me tell you what, what we, we did do, because you, again, you need to be uh, deliberate about this. So the, when I was appointed Minister of Health in the context I described yesterday of, um, of the democratization, the, the first democratic election, we, the title we gave to the strategic plan for the Ministry of Health was the democratization of health. <laughs> because the context that I was talking was here's a country that finally is taking the step towards democracy. And my whole point was, this is great, but the transition to democracy doesn't end with the democratization of political rights, the right to vote most notably, it has to include social rights. And that, and that therefore led to having that overriding construct of the democratization of health as a driver of, of, of our policy. And something that might look very technical like that insurance program we designed for the, for the um, this, this was mostly for people that didn't have a salary job because in Mexico, like in the United States and many other countries, employment was a determinant of your access. And that meant saying, no, this is a universal citizen's right. It cannot be mediated by the fact that you have a salary job. Everyone needs to have access to insurance. So we created what a public insurance plan for the, uh, the uninsured, with most of whom were people, not in the informal sector, but people who work by their own. The largest group of whom were peasants who were uninsured because they didn't have an employer and therefore very poor people. So, um, so, so th th that, that was the idea of democratization, but we accompanied that with the organization of something we called the, an annual event called the Citizens Forum on Health. And what we did is we produced a report, not the typical bureaucratic report that we had to send by law to Congress and to the, you know, the Ministry of Finance, uh, and which is very important for accountability with you know, lots of numbers that no one reads. We produced a very visual report and we ranked the performance of the states, Mexico is a federal republic with 32 states, on outcomes that were easily understandable by people, including some that reflected, for example, poor nutrition, lower educational levels, low allocations, from the state level budget for health. And we would convene, we had agreed on the state level secretaries of health on that set of, um, I think there were 30 indicators that we would report and compare and do a sort of scorecard that would be made publicly available. And the idea was this citizens forum, we would bring together and would invite all the NGOs that were active, civil organizations, political parties, everyone was invited and we released that report and explained. And I have to tell you, the pressure that the state secretaries had from their governors, when it turned out they were at the lowest part of the, of the ranking because you know they, were, they, they, they had the lowest coverage and some important dimension was very important. But the most important thing is it mobilized the civil society to demand services. And my theory was that to move the bureaucracy, we needed that external force. And it was a key part of the idea of democratization. I think now with what we've seen with the mis and disinformation spurred by this wave of populism acting in conjunction with social media in the middle of a pandemic, involving the public actively is important because Dr. Brundtland used to say in WHO, there are communicable diseases 
and then there are communicated diseases. <laughs> and mis- and disinformation can be more serious communicated diseases. And so I think part of that better normal has to be a reinvigorated uh, impetus to, to uh, double down on community involvement and engagement as a major, again, it's not one or the other, it's a way of acting on social determinants. It's also a way of pushing the formal healthcare system to perform better and to make itself accountable to the people that, that we're supposed to serve. That, that's actually really, that's a really interesting story. Um, okay, I have five more questions, but I'm not going to because I'm looking at our time. So I'm gonna ask one last question. Um, can you, um, you these, uh, these conversations are, are watched by students and uh, which is uh, part of the intent. Um, can you tell a story about what motivated you? And uh, you've had um, you've had a, a wonderful path in um, so many aspects of uh, public health. And uh, what uh, what has motivated you? What has what has informed um, what you have done in these in these many roles? Well, you know, you know, I can tell you what's the motivation. I'm, I'm the child of refugees people escaping from the horrors of uh, fascism in the 1930s and finding refuge in a country that was much poorer, Mexico, than Germany, which was the country they were escaping from. And, uh, and you know, that made my life possible. So I have a very strong sense of this idea of generosity towards strangers. It's easy to be generous to your family members and friends. But when my grandparents with my father, who was six years old, arrived into Mexico, <clears throat> barely speaking the language my grandmother, looking very different, um, it was a generosity towards those strangers that saved their life and made my life possible. But to me, that then the story that I think will resonate with some of your students is I was a medical student living in a very unequal society. Social inequality in Mexico is the big scourge of, of, of Mexico and most of Latin America and many other parts of the world. So at some point, much as I love clinical practice, I was getting restless at saying, but you know, why do people get sick in the first place? How, what can we do to avoid? I, I wasn't using the language of social determinants, but that was very much in my mind. And that was during my internship <clears throat> where I made the cr critical career decision that instead of pursuing the, what would have been a standard residency, and I passed the, the education, the ACFMG, the exam, you know, just to make it clear that I wasn't going, I, I wasn't avoiding that because I wasn't good enough. And I decided to go into public health because I saw that as a pathway for acting on the upstream determinants. And I was very aware. And because I was a very good student, some of my friends were very distraught and my teachers and said, does that mean you're gonna give up patient, seeing patients? And I said, no, it just means that from now on, society will be my patient. And, and, and that's when people say, so what do you do in public health? I say, I say, public health, you are in public health when society becomes your patient, when you understand that what you're doing is acting at the level of the entire society to improve health. And, and so that was the, the, the insight I had in the middle of my internship in a hospital, enjoying very much clinical care but saying, um, I, I'm very rewarded by helping one patient at a time. And I think this is incredibly valuable and, and we should always value and reward those heroes that are at the front lines. But I want my own impact to be by acting at the level of society as a whole. And that instead of doing what would have, the same number of years it would have taken me to do a, a residency, I invested in getting a PhD in, in public health. and. Um, and, and, and embarking in that pathway. <clears throat> Great story, thank you. Um, Dr. Frank, it's really a privilege to um, have this conversation. I actually only wish we could uh, continue it much longer and I look forward to many more such conversations. Thank you for um, taking the time. Thank you for everything you've done and thank you for being a part of this, uh, of this discussion. And thank you for that excellent work uh, of, of the commission, the 3D commission. I think it's gonna be transformative. Thank you. And thank you to everybody for being a part of this. Everybody have a good day.